Great Scott. Great Scott. Great Scott. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fabulous episode of Great Scott. I'm Scotty V. Thanks for watching. John Shea. John Shea played Lex Luthor back in the 90s on the Lois and Clark New Adventures of Superman television show. A lot of people had a problem with him because he had hair and he kind of had sex appeal. He had charm. He was kind of good looking. He was going to be a romantic interest for Lois Lane. I loved him personally. I thought he was the greatest Lex Luthor I've seen on screen. Before John Shea, we had uh, the 50s interpretation of Luthor or the... Superman, the movie interpretation, the Gene Hackman kind of goofy, cheesy Luthor, and that has its place. It's nice and fun. We had Lex Luthor on the Superboy series, and that whole series was kind of a tad askew. Uh, we had Luthor on the radio program. We've had many interpretations of Luthor. Most of them on screen have been kind of campy, kind of cheesy, kind of silly. Michael Rosenbaum portrayed Lex Luthor for about 10 years on Smallville. And he was fantastic. We saw a different facet to Luthor. We saw a growing up Luthor. We saw a guy who was trying to do well and trying to be Clark's friend, but wanted to find out what everybody was doing. So he kept spying on them and checking them out and having cameras everywhere and keeping files on everybody. And eventually he spiraled into darkness, and that was fantastic. But my favorite Lex Luthor by far is the businessman Lex Luthor, the manipulative Lex Luthor that has people working for him and has them do all the dirty work, Lex Luthor. Not that he's afraid to get his hands dirty. He's been known to strangle a person or two. But, for the most part, so that he can stay clean, he makes sure that everything gets done outside of him so, those, so there's never any proof. Here in the final scene of Season 1 of Lois and Clark, Lex Luthor's world comes tumbling down as he's about to marry Lois Lane, Perry White, and Jimmy Olsen, and Inspector Henderson all jam into the room and uh, tell him that there's finally proof. They accuse him of being a criminal. They know he's involved in stuff, and they take him down. But he gets away. He uses kung fu. He smashes some people, and he throws over a cop, and he uh, runs down to make sure his nemesis Superman is dead in a kryptonite cage that he built for him, but Superman has escaped, which just further pisses Lex off. He hears the police coming, he runs up to his penthouse, and he decides to jump out the window. After he does this, he dies, but then Gretchen Kelly, his doctor from the comic books, who appears in the series, brings him back later. But in a much more limited capacity, Deborah Joy Levine, who produced the show and was a huge creative force on it for the first season, said, we never intended to have Lex Luthor be the big baddie for the whole series. We thought that would get a little stale, a little boring. So we wanted him to come back and we wanted him to be around, but we never intended to use him in the same capacity that we used him in the first season where he was on almost every episode. John Shea, on the other hand, said that the show became too tasking for him on a personal level because he lived so far away. I think it was Montana. His family was there. He wasn't seeing his children and he didn't want to make the trip to spend full days every day all year while they were filming anymore. But he was glad to come back and do a few episodes in every season from that time going forward. John Shea was a cool Lex, a charming Lex, a Lex who could get Lois to feel like she loved him, a Lex who could get Lois to feel like she wanted to marry him. He was a foil for Clark Kent, whom this show was about more so than Superman because the action and the adventure was secondary, whereas the romance and the personal plot lines of the characters was very paramount, which is why I always loved this show. But it was a little cheesy, and especially after Lex Luthor departed, the villains got goofy. We had villains like Bob, Master of the Universe, sitting playing with action figures, which I'm sure was an homage to Rick Moranis, in Spaceballs, but just wasn't as funny, who was able to somehow be a foil to Superman later. And this makes Superman lesser when his enemies are goofy, and they're still able to provide some sort of a risk to Superman. It makes Superman not look as cool, but Lex Luthor, super smart. You know, in, in back in the old days, he was this kind of rotund scientist who wore a lab coat and created things. And Lex could still do that. Lex, on this show, we didn't see that much of, but he had ideas. He did create the kryptonite cage, and he created some other things. Later on, he had a gun and some things that he used against Superman. So he had a scientific mind, but he wasn't per se a scientist. He was more a businessman. He was a manipulative man. He was a guy who could get things done, and he had confidence and arrogance, and he was ballsy, and he was awesome. And it was all because of 
John Shea, and because of the portrayal they decided to go with, which came from the John Byrne Superman reboot, Man of Steel, in the 80s, which was my favorite interpretation of the Lex Luthor character. I just, I love that interpretation. I hope we see that in the Batman v Superman movie. Of course, with that, we're going with a younger Lex, a Lex that seems more a contemporary of Superman, maybe the same age or around the same age, maybe even younger. I think the actor is younger who's playing him in the Batman v Superman movie. But I've always loved Lex, and I always love when he's portrayed as a man who is really eloquent in speech, can say a lot, is smart, knows a lot, can get people to do things for him. I also like him as a bit of a ladies' man. I also like him with some martial arts skills and some self-defense skills for himself. Although, it's not necessary for Lex to be a big muscle, beefy guy because he's not the brawler. He's not the guy who gets into hand-to-hand -hand situations with Superman. He's the guy who hurts him by doing things to him behind the scenes that Superman always knows Lex did, but that can never be proven. And I love John Shea. This year, John Shea will be appearing at the Superman celebration on Friday the 12th and Saturday the 13th in Autograph Lane or Autograph Alley or whatever it's called. There won't be a ticket for that. Now, with the other celebrities that often come, you have to stand in line earlier and get tickets, and they only give so many out in order to get in line and uh, get autographs from the celebrities. A lot of times the celebrities' autographs are free. By what I'm hearing and what we're reporting on the Superman homepage, there may be a fee to get an autograph from John Shea, which, as I stated with Dean Cain last year, is unfortunate. But if there was anybody that would get me to go to the Superman celebration if I was on the fence, it would be John Shea or Dean Cain, something along those lines. Last year I wanted to go, couldn't. This year I wanted to go, couldn't. If something was going to change my mind, it would be the fact that awesome John Shea is going to be there. So the fact that you get to meet him, if you're there, have a good time. Get his autograph if you like. Meet a guy who portrayed Lex Luthor in an awesome way and I feel doesn't really get his due for playing Lex so coolly. Thanks everybody for watching. And remember, I must confess it brings me a certain satisfaction that everyone in the city has to look up in order to see me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another convergent episode of Great Scott. I'm Scotty V. Thanks for watching. So, we're coming down to the wire on the convergence. We're coming down to the mystery being solved as to what's going to happen at the end of this major storyline from DC. Steve and I, from the Superman homepage, did our radio show this week, which is the Superman KAL podcast. We do it at the end of every month. Check it out on supermanhomepage.com where we talked quite a bit about Convergence and quite a bit about our thoughts on why it happened and what it means and how it went down and what's coming up next. Not too long ago, I discussed how I'm not that miffed about the fact that Superman is going to be wearing a t-shirt and jeans and some boots in the uh, next edition of his costume, because I don't think that that's a costume. Uh, I had a fan write me that... Uh, he doesn't agree with me because it's not particularly super of him to be wearing a t-shirt. Anybody can wear a t-shirt. I can wear a t-shirt. You can wear a t-shirt. We can have an S on us. That doesn't make us a Superman. No, of course not. But Superman is Superman. Even if he's without his powers, he's still the person who was Superman. So the essence of him, the idea that he's going to keep up an ever-ending fight, even if he doesn't have his costume, is what I was referring to when I said I still thought it was heroic and inspiring. I don't think the costume should last. I'm not saying he should continue to wear a t-shirt and jeans. I just think as, as part of whatever's coming up here, it might be interesting to find out why he's wearing that. And it's not going to happen for too long. Now, what Steve and I were discussing on the podcast this month was, is this just another event in the New 52 Superman's life that has been pretty much event after event without a whole lot of character building and the idea that we haven't had good stories. We haven't had things that were compelling happen about Superman. We've just had this new Superman in kind of an armored suit, missing the briefs, and not really being the Superman that fans want Superman to be. A lot of people continuing to come out and say, this isn't Superman. This guy isn't acting like Superman. And now you have Lois uh, doing things like revealing his identity, and now the whole world knows who he is. So, is somehow, even though Convergence is going to wrap up, before we finish this truth arc, and before we see how he gets his new new 
costume or new clothing that he's wearing. Convergence is already going to be over, which is this battle of the multiverse and this thing going on, but then we have the dark side war coming up, and we have, the, as I say, the truth arc happening in Superman comics. Is that going to be a continuation of what happened in Convergence? In other words, now that the multiverse is shattering, as Dr. Fate here says in this panel, and of course we see the version of Superman where he is wearing the briefs because we've got multiverse versions of all the characters. Are we then somehow going to merge all these characters? Are somehow going to take an amalgam of, of pieces of each universe and put them together into one as Telos, Telos, Telos uh, is going to tell us how these people uh, are going to end up looking the way they look? Or are we just going to go back to the New 52? Now, initially, when DC announced that they were going to take the New 52 moniker off the title of all their comics starting in June, they did say that the continuity was still going to continue. But would they want to tell us right then that it was going to end, since that's what Convergence is all about? If that is what it's about, they wouldn't want to tell us that. They would want us to get to the end of the story ourselves. I think it's a little bit of a cop-out to just end the New 52 in that manner, but if they get back to some stories and some characters that people love, the Lois Lane that people love, the Superman that people love, and, and they get back to good storytelling, it won't matter in the end. It'll become a wash. But is the New 52 a colossal failure? Is it one of these things that people are going to talk about in the future and say, uh, see what DC said? They were changing their entire line and it was going to be the New 52 from now on. And then four years later, when it didn't really work out all that well, they announced that they were just going to go back to what it was. It's kind of like... Everyone got annoyed that their versions of the characters were ending, but at the time, pre-New 52 comics, nobody was all that thrilled about Superman comics anyway. We did the grounded arc, there wasn't that much great going on, people were complaining that the stories weren't that great. It seemed to me that most of the fans who weren't happy about the New 52 weren't happy because Superman's costume was changing, which is interesting because we have another time now where his costume is going to change. and I, I can just imagine the people in editorial, not to say they're doing a great job, not to say they're doing a terrible job, but I just imagine them saying, look at this, we announced that Superman was going to be wearing an armor suit, he was going to be coming from Krypton, uh, you know, he was going to be more Kryptonian, he was going to be more alien, his parents were already going to be dead, he wasn't going to have as many connections to humanity, he wasn't going to be married to Lois, Jimmy was going to be his only friend, and Lois is his best friend, although... It never really got anywhere with that. We said it from the beginning. They were best friends. They really knew each other. But there wasn't really a whole lot of interaction between Clark and Lois in the New 52. They announced all of this. People said, armor, suit. Why does Superman need armor? It was a ceremonial, but it also had function because it wouldn't get destroyed in battle. And now they're getting rid of the armor, and people are complaining and saying, this isn't a Superman suit. What kind of a thing is this? And I agree to that extent, but I also liked the New 52 suit. I also liked the original suit. The, the pants on the outside has always been a sticking point for Superman and non-Superman fans. And are they necessary? I don't think so. Is it necessary that it has to be cloth as opposed to armor? Especially if it's either based on or directly made from the fortress in conjunction with what the costumes, what the armor, what the ceremonial outfits looked like on Krypton. It makes sense that he would wear something like that. If it's made that way, so what? But now he's not going to have that, and there are just as many issues with that. So, at the end of truth, the point I'm trying to make is, are we going to see the return to the cl more classic costume that people really like, or are we going to go back to the new 52 costume, minus the briefs, or are we going to have a new costume altogether? It seems like Superman and other characters have been getting new costumes constantly, on a regular basis, m month after month, uh, whether it takes a couple of years or a couple of months. It just seems like it's, it's constant changing, even since the New 52 happened. The New 52 was a big change, was supposed to be the future, was supposed to be a starting point for everybody. And I don't think a lot of new people are going, oh, it's the New 52 now, now I'm going to buy. Uh, an arc like Truth, where uh, they, they put out this sneak peek that's free, where you see that Lois Lane is, is going to reveal Superman's identity, maybe that's going to get readers, or maybe that's going to get old readers who left back. I don't know, because most people are up in arms that Lois would do something like that. I'm interested to see why it happened, how it happened, and how it's going to resolve itself. And I'd like to see us get back to some really compelling, interesting Superman stories. I haven't read a whole lot that was great. Convergence uh, was a mishmash of really confusing stuff that didn't make a whole lot of sense. And you've got to wonder, did they just do this so that they could cover their move from New York City to L.A.? Because that's where the D.C. company is moving to. They had their headquarters right in New York City, and now they're going to be in L.A., and this was something that could 
kind of get them through that without having to worry about too many story things. They had this one idea and they just kind of uh, ran it out and uh, it's one thing after another, but no real resolution, no real start to any of the stories uh, except for the main Convergence title, which is about characters that nobody really knows. You know, there's a Batman, there's a Superman, but they're not they're not the Batman and Superman people were looking for, but it looks like they're all going to come together as we reach the end, and that's kind of interesting to see all of them finally working together when it looked like Talos was going to make them fight and kill each other, and so many people were acting out of character in order to do that. We'll see what happens. I'm interested to find out where it goes from here, and hopefully, most importantly, where, where it's not briefs versus armor or t-shirt versus bloody fists. It's more about, to me, that we get good interesting, cool Superman stories again, and I hope that happens soon. Thanks for watching, and remember, always look up in the sky. This is the part where I say I don't wanna, I'm just gonna live This is the part where I break free, cause I just can't take it no more.